Hey, thanks for tuning in to Cross Defense. On this show, we love to hear from our listeners, and today's show is coming from a listener's concern regarding a previous show last year, you know, way back when, in December. <laughs> Today, we're looking at the Magi and their paganism. Hold on to your hats, my friends. The Epiphany season is here, and this is going to be fun. Let's get into it. What are we talking about today? Christ being visited by pagan men of science, or was it pseudoscience? Ah, probably both. They were diviners and astrologists, after all, magicians were talking about the truth of Scripture, freeing us to be bold, like St. Matthew and St. Paul, like Jesus in our confession of the truth. Greetings in the name of Christ Jesus, and welcome to the first episode of Cross Defense in the 2023rd year of our Lord. 2023 is here. The wait is getting intense, isn't it? Our refrain continues, come Lord, come quickly, and he will come at just the right time. While we wait, we heed the instruction of Paul issued to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 13 to 16. We will devote ourselves to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation, to teaching, that is doctrine. That's all the word doctrine means. It's not a dirty word. It just means teaching. We keep a close watch on ourselves and on the teaching, the doctrine of Scripture, persisting in it. Why? Mm, good question. For by so doing, St. Paul says, you will save both yourself and your hearers. He's talking to Pastor Timothy, but that applies to all of us. By paying attention to right doctrine, holding true to true doctrine, true teaching, the apostolic teaching of the Bible, you will save yourself as you remain true to Christ who saves you, and your hearers, your neighbors, your family, your friends, your co-workers, your peers of all stripes, those people God put in your life, they will hear of the gospel too, and so they will be saved by Christ Jesus as well. That, my friends, is what being a Christian is all about, saving our hearers, being the tools, the instruments the Holy Spirit uses to bring our neighbors both the law and the gospel, convicting their consciences of the reality of their sin and applying the comfort that only the gospel can give. It's a matter of true life or death, eternal life, eternal death. It's a matter unfathomably more important than even the concern of bodily death. I know that's hard for us to grasp practically. We may say it ideologically, but it's hard for us to grasp practically because that is one of our greatest fears, if not the greatest fear in our conscience, that is the fear of death, the fear of dying. And that is why Jesus conquered death. There is something far worse, my friends, than dying. We commonly call it hell. Eternal separation from God is unfathomably worse than your body being laid to rest in the dirt because that is temporal. That is momentary. Eternal separation from God is, well, as I just said, eternal. And so you go to church. That's the public reading of scripture Paul's talking about in 1 Timothy, isn't it? But we don't care about life or death only on Sunday morning in the divine service. We, when we hear the public reading of Scripture there, that is to shape every day of our lives. This is why Luther's advice is so good. Keep watch, he says. Study. Attende lectione. <laughs> I always... <laughs> I always say my Latin with a little bit of an Italian uh, accent there. No, uh, no, no offense meant to anyone who is of Italian origin <laughs> or who can actually say Latin words properly. But that's our source for the word lectionary, lectern, isn't it? Attende lectione, lectione. Attend to reading. Truly, the old reformer said you cannot read scripture too much. You can't. And what you do read, you cannot read too well. And what you read well, you cannot understand too well. And what you understand well, you cannot teach too well. And what you teach well, you cannot live too well. It is the devil, the world, and the flesh that are ranting and raging against us. Therefore, 
Therefore, beloved lords and brothers, pastors and preachers, I'd add Christians of all vocations, pray, read, study, and keep busy in this business. Attende lectione. And so you go to church on Sunday, don't you? And you go to Bible study on Sunday, on Wednesday, maybe on a Tuesday. We're adding one of those here at St. Mark's. And you pray, you pray, you pray, and you read the scriptures. And you listen to shows like this, Cross the Fence, <laughs> all the shows here on KFUO. But here, where our goal is to equip the mind, excite the sanctified imagination, and comfort your soul with God's word. To quote Luther again, truly at this evil, shameful time, it is not time for loafing, for snoring, for sleeping. You can sleep in later. You want to be in church to hear the word of God. You've been called by the Lord to participate, my friends, to participate in the saving of lives, not temporally, eternally, which is far more important. The Christian, by virtue of his baptism into the body of Christ, is one of the paraclete's paramedics, if you want to say it that way, a servant to his neighbor, used by God to give his neighbor life to rescue him from death. Christ did all the work. And now in God's infinite wisdom, <laughs> I don't know what he's thinking, he's chosen to let each of us, even me, participate in the wonderful work of saving lives as the Holy Spirit moves us to live as Christians, listening to God as he speaks to us his word and then speaking that word to others. Hmm. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. All right, so it is Saturday, the 7th of January, 2023, which means yesterday was the epiphany of our Lord. The gospel reading is Matthew 2, 1 to 12. We're going to read that in its entirety in just a minute. This is the Magi visiting Jesus, and this is going to be the focus of today's show. But I suspect not in the way you might be anticipating. Most reflections on this text end up talking about or focusing on the fact that the Magi followed a star to get to Jesus. As they said, for we saw the star, his star, when it rose and have come to worship him. Matthew 2.2. 2. We talked a lot about signs in the sun, moon, and stars in our previous episode last year, right before our Christmas break. And instead of continuing in that grain... That was my original intention. Instead of doing that, we're going we're gonna to bring the conversation back to earth today. To consider the paganism, yes, the paganism of the Magi. A Christian brother was bothered by our December 10th show. And as it works out, his concern can be addressed in brotherly love by looking at Matthew 2. 1 to 12. So if you got your Bibles with you, open them up to Matthew 2, 1 to 12. Is that what I said a minute ago? That's what I meant to say. Whatever I said, I meant Matthew 2, 1 to 12. Uh, open there with me now and let's read this pericope and then we'll, uh, we'll get into our, our show, our conversation and uh, really focus on the Magi. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men, Magi, from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him, and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you, from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, 
And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and they worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. This is our text. Okay, so James, our dear Christian brother, went to stmarksferndale.com slash contact, where you can go to send in your messages as well, your comments. And he wrote saying, I'm a lifelong LCMS Lutheran, and I am a retired public high school history teacher. I listened with interest to your podcast, Ancient Apocalypse, The Flood, and the Migdal of Babel. I wanted to share some thoughts with you and welcome a reply from you on the same. I'm familiar with Graham Hancock and his ideas and am troubled by your enthusiasm for his program, Ancient Apocalypse, on Netflix. If I understand you correctly, you think Hancock is rightly challenging mainstream science on human prehistory and think that's a good thing. Please correct me if I'm wrong. My first concern is that you're even promoting Graham Hancock. He is a new age crank who has said drugs are mind expanding, that the Ark of the Covenant is hidden in a church in Ethiopia, and that Atlantis was real and located in Antarctica. He is obviously either crazy or a con artist. No one should be giving this guy publicity. My second concern is that it's dangerous for Christians to give credence to pseudo-history or pseudo-science because they think it supports the Bible. This has happened too many times in the past, and he gives some examples. We serve the God of truth, so it is wrong to use falsehood to quote-unquote honor him. It also makes Christians look gullible to give credence to hokum, and so damages the church's witness. And being proven wrong over dubious claims makes apologists for the faith look foolish and untrustworthy, further damaging the cause of the gospel. My third concern is that promoting the ideas of Graham Hancock undermines people's faith in sound science, particularly archaeology. We especially do not need more encouragement to distrust science in general in our day. To use an obvious example, thousands of people, many of them Christians, have gotten sick or died from COVID-19 and other treatable illnesses because quacks and conspiracy theorists encourage Christians to distrust doctors and scientists. Graham Hancock is not a historian, an archaeologist, or a geologist. People trained in those fields, Christians among them, just shake their heads at this guy's notions. But he constantly claims that there is a conspiracy, quote-unquote, among academics to, quote-unquote, suppress his ideas. That alone is a key indicator of his being a huckster. A close friend of mine just recently sent me a video clip from Graham Hancock being interviewed by Joe Rogan, another promoter of drug abuse, and I was concerned that he would actually be taking Hancock seriously. So that's what sparked my interest in your podcast. I look forward to hearing your thoughts. Sincerely, James. Okay, so first of all, thank you, James. Thank you so very much. I am extremely grateful that you took the time to send in your thoughts. We like to hear from our listeners here at Cross Defense, even when they have dissenting thoughts. This is part of being brothers in Christ. It's how iron sharpens iron. We have the conversation. It's a wonderful blessing, and thank you for doing that. So let's walk through your concerns. Let's equip our minds along the way. Let's excite our imaginations along the way. And and let's comfort our souls with God's word along the way. And I hope put to rest any of your concerns. Yes, brother, you are correct. I think it's a good thing, a great thing for Graham Hancock to challenge mainstream science regarding human prehistory. Guilty as charged. Mainstream science, let's maybe call it popular science, and certainly not all the Christians who are working within that realm, let's be clear about that, but mainstream science rejects God. The, the overall narrative, the, the overarching narrative of mainstream science rejects God. 
rejects creation, rejects miracles. It rejects Jesus' birth, which we just celebrated at Christmas, and his miraculous resurrection, Easter. So all of Christianity is rejected by mainstream science. Mainstream science is saturated in evolutionary thought. So I can't help but, but appreciate anyone who pushes back against the godless narrative of mainstream popular science because it's lies. It's Darwinian evolutionary Marxist lies have captured the Western world and led us away from Christianity and into an era of humanism. We've been duped by the hijacking of science to believe lies and to disregard truth. Now, and I, if you're wondering why I threw in Marxist there, because Marx is very heavily influenced by Darwin's thought, it's all connected. It's all related. And so, yes, when we reject the mainstream, what I'm saying is we're rejecting the world, as the Bible teaches. We are not of this world. My appreciation for Hancock is in the same grain as my appreciation for, say, Ken Ham and Answers in Genesis or the Institute for Creation Research and the like, these kind of guys that I've quoted on the show before. See, creationists are not part of the mainstream science either. We're mocked and ridiculed. We're called hucksters and cranks and gullible and foolish. And yet we continue to condone creationism and creation science because we know it's true. Now, I said in the show, obviously, uh, maybe not obviously, but go back and listen to it. We have lots of questions as Christians for Graham Hancock. We don't agree with all his theories. We are highly suspect of much of what he has to say, as I mentioned in the show. We don't agree with his timetable. In fact, I even mentioned that much of his error is because he is still, too, working from an evolutionary thought process, but he is groping around for the truth and he has found his way to a global flood, and that's the part where we say, yes, aha, uh -huh, pushing back against that, that narrative so we can get back to the truth of Scripture. It's opening the door for a conversation like this one we're having right now to be able to say, not everybody agrees with evolutionary thought. So that's the grain in which I am a great, I am greatly, I should say, greatly appreciative of someone like Graham Hancock who's pushing back against the narrative. And in this regard, we have a very similar situation to what we find in Mark 9, 38 to 41. It's not the exact same. No, no, it's not. But the point is there. What do we read when we turn our Bibles to Mark 9, 38 to 41? John said, teacher, to Jesus, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. And we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not stop him. For no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able to soon afterward speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. Now I said it's not the same, but it does get to the point. We don't have to be afraid to use the words of the pagans, of the unbelievers, as we proclaim the gospel. We, we cite Josephus on this show quite often. He's not a believer in Jesus. He's writing for a Roman patron. He himself is Jewish. The cards are stacked against Christianity, and yet we are advocates of using Josephus as a historian to proclaim the truth. His thoughts, his words, his writings. We can do the same with a modern person working in the same kind of field. All right, let's take a break right there. We'll come back, and we'll continue to try to solve our brother's unrest regarding uh, the December 10th show. All right, this is great. I hope we're all being equipped, excited, and comforted. Thanks for tuning in to Cross Defense for 2023. We'll be right back. All right, so as we get back into this conversation again, I want to reiterate my appreciation to James for writing in with his concern. He is being, as Paul said to Timothy, watchful. He is guarding his heart, the good doctrine that has been given to him. He is making sure it's not being corrupted and tainted, and for that he is setting a great example. I wish all of us would be as concerned 
as James is. Thank you so much, brother, for that. Um, we live in an age of information. We live in an age of YouTube and podcasts and Netflix and everything and blogs and Twitter. People can throw out their ideas and they stick to a lot of consciences, whether they're good or bad. So we need to be more vigilant than ever. Thank you, James, for demonstrating that today. We want to make sure we take everything back to Scripture, think it through biblically, and see what is right and true and stick to that. So uh, thanks again. Now, Matthew 2, 1 to 12, the visit of the Magi, is extremely helpful in addressing your first concern, brother, that I even promoted Graham Hancock at all um, and his show, Ancient Apocalypse, on Netflix. As you said, he's a New Age crank who's obviously either crazy or a con artist, etc. Those are your words. This concern seems to be to me, if I'm reading your email right, uh, the lifeblood of all three of your concerns. Now, basically, it's the question of what on earth is this faithful pastor in the faithful church doing associating with the uncleanliness of this highly questionable man whose wisdom is sourced from all sorts of places other than Scripture and who promotes things contrary to Scripture? Now, even before we look at the Magi, I hope we can all recognize that Jesus was attacked by the institutional church of his day, the lifelong Jews of his days, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, for associating with social, socially questionable sort, the outcasts, the prostitutes and tax collectors, the sinners. They looked at that and they said, oh, who is this guy? He can't possibly be a man of good reputation. Look who he's having dinner with. Look who he's associating with. So, dear brother, dear everyone listening to Cross Defense, if, if St. Matthew, if the Lord himself agreed with this position, that we can't even associate with what is rightly said by the pagan, by the, the unclean, we would have no biblical account of the, the pagan magi visiting our Lord in St. Matthew, would we? New Age cranks are just repristinating old world paganism, right? So whereas St. Luke's gospel is considered to be for a Gentile audience among whom the Medo Persian or Babylonian ranks of Magi would be numbered, St. Matthew wrote his gospel primarily for a Jewish audience who were knowledgeable in the Old Testament lifelong Jews. And he, nor the Holy Spirit who inspired him, my friends, he didn't even bat an eye when it came to giving the godless magi publicity in the process of using what they had right, what they were doing right, to teach God's people the truth. To the inclusion of the magi in the gospel of St. Matthew, it would, it would have had the exact same effect on Matthew's initial audience, his churched audience, his Jewish audience, that my riffing on Graham Hancock's show had for James. Truly, Matthew's hearers were lifelong Jews. The learned, the well-educated, the churched. Matthew put his record, his vinyl record, on the turntable, he moved the needle into position, and the music started playing. Now, there are a few scratches and crackles in the Jewish lineage of Jesus, chapter 1. Maybe, maybe Matthew just needs to clean the needle a little bit, get the dust out of the grooves. But then comes Matthew 2, verse 1, and a giant loud scratch of the vinyl record catches every good Jew's attention. See, that's what the inclusion of the Magi is. And so we get the pay attention word that we've all learned to skim right by. Behold, Magi from the East came to Jerusalem. Behold is not simply Bible ease for a new scene. No, it's, it's look at this. Pay attention to this thing right here. This is important. Can you believe what's going on? Behold. Now, here's, here's the Savior of the world, the Jewish Messiah, come into the flesh, and pagan cranks are doing what no Israelite has yet to do. 
those who dabble in pseudoscience, astrology, and divination, magic of all sorts. What on earth is St. Matthew doing giving publicity to magicians? See, in the last episode, I focused on the fact that we don't look up into the heavens to get our wisdom. And we talked a little bit about how when the Magi, having read the signs of the heavens, they showed up in Jerusalem. Herod, King Herod, inquired of Israel's wise men as to where the king of the world, the Messiah, was to be born, right? The king would be born. We read that already in our text. And they looked down into the scriptures, Israel's wise men, looked down into the scriptures for their answers, not into the heavens. Micah 5.2 tells them Bethlehem is where he'll be born. And we made the point in that episode that in this case, they present us with a model of where we are to look for true wisdom into scripture, God's word. It's all there in the last show. Go take a listen. But there's something more to this Magi story. If the Israelites had the true source of wisdom, and they did, and if they knew how to use it, which seems questionable, how was it that pagan sages from the East showed up on the scene to give gifts to the king of the Jews before any Jews did? Scripture doesn't tell God's people to ignore creation altogether. No. Scripture tells us to read the signs of the sun, the moon, and the stars. In light of God's word, Jesus tells us there will be signs in the heavens regarding his return to read them, interpret them in light of the word. So what is Matthew doing here? Well, quite simply, he's telling the truth. The guys that we don't want to get any of the publicity, the pagan cranks, well, they were on the scene. That's why it's okay to appreciate Graham Hancock for what he is on the scene telling people that there was a global flood. That's the truth. There was a global flood. That's the reality. None of the other stuff matters. We can take what's good from what he's saying and, and use his words while we throw away all the garbage. Truth is truth. As Justin Martyr said, whatever is rightly said, is it becomes the property of the church. We can use it to proclaim the truth of God's word. The evidence seems to lead to the conclusion that the Magi were from an old and powerful caste of meadow persian sages. So these would have been the better educated pagan wise men <laughs> of their day. But still working in astrology still divining, doing magic. These were the guys that Daniel beat out when he was called into service of Nebuchadnezzar. These are the guys who can't answer the question for Pharaoh, but Joseph can. So we, we're always dealing with a contest between the world and its wisdom and God. And his foolishness, <laughs> the foolishness of God, is wiser than the wisdom of the world. They weren't probably the huckster con artist sort of magicians that maybe we want to think about. That's more the, the sort that the Babylonians are known to have produced. But now look at how we're talking about this. Look what we've shifted into. We're categorizing one sort of pagan over and against another. The truth of the matter remains, they were all magi. They went to Herod's court, as would be expected, for the same reason they brought gifts to the king of the Jews, to our king, Jesus. Because that's what magi do. They serve kings. They're the council from whom king, kings seek wisdom. They're not kings themselves. We three kings of or No, they're not kings themselves. They serve kings. The Magi are a priestly caste filling the cabinet of the king. This is the presidential cabinet we're talking about. The book of Daniel is an excellent, excellent source to better understand the work of the Magi, the work of the council of the king. Uh, a study of Daniel also would 
serve to dispel any hang-ups regarding God's people serving their neighbors through association with unbelievers, because the entire book of Daniel is the story of Daniel working alongside unbelievers for the sake of Israel. So James's second concern is that it's dangerous for Christians to give credence to pseudo-history or pseudo-science because they think it supports the Bible. See, it's a doomed position to start from any angle, any angle of human reasoning to prove the Bible, be it pseudo-history or true history, pseudo-science or true science. We can't even start categorizing which type is better than the other. True history, false history, true science, false history. If that's the starting point, if human reason is the starting point, we're doomed to failure. The faulty human wisdom will not hold the truth. So thank you for bringing that up, James. It calls to mind what Robert Preuss said when teaching about Luther's and, and therefore our preoccupation with true doctrine which is what you're seeking after, thanks be to God. Reverend Preuss said that Luther insists that the evangelical doctrine, by standing on Scripture, stands on its own merits. We're never, ever, ever concerned with proving the Bible's truth. That's not what apologetics is. That's not what confessing the truth is. We don't have to prove the Bible is true. Preuss says it better than I can. There is no need to settle anything about doctrine, which includes the teaching of the flood, etc., for doctrine determines all other things, standing as it does on Scripture alone. Doctrine, the teaching of the Bible, determines all other things. So let your concern be put to rest, brother. When we give any sort of credence to something, it's always and only because it says what the Bible is saying. And it may not say it after the next thing. Its paths may cross momentarily. But at that intersection, it's saying what the Bible says. And so we're going to take that captive and use it however we wish. It's not the other way around. We're never starting from science and saying, oh, see how uh, the Bible is true because science says so. No, no. The Bible is true because the Bible says so. It's the word of God. It stands on its own merits. That credence that we give to others, to the the words of men, it is taken captive for God's use in service to the gospel, in service to scripture. Consider consider Jesus' parable of the dishonest manager, manager in Luke 16. 1 to 13. It's sufficient to demonstrate this point. Our Lord's use of a dishonest manager has always confused many people. But only when we start from our human reason is it confusing. When we start from God, when we start from Scripture being God's Word, when we start from there, things become quite clear and we get the lesson. So I'll leave you all to do that a little bit of homework on your own. Take a look at Luke 16, 1 to 13. All right, so in respect to the ancient apocalypse episode, we, we could have found a thousand man-made touch points to talk about the global flood and the, the primeval history of the patriarchs. We could, we could have started from any point uh, just as a vehicle for the episode's theme. They're useful handles, that's all, handles for proclaiming God's wisdom, gospel handles. They're useful for equipping the Christian mind exciting the the Christian imagination and comforting the Christian soul. Christ has never been shy, never been shy about using touchstones that relate to all people to proclaim the gospel. That's what the parables are about. So, uh, and and especially regarding that, that use, Jesus' use of the parable of the dishonest manager, James says, we serve the God of truth, and so, I, absolutely, but he says, so it's wrong to use falsehood to honor him. Now, the parable of the dishonest manager is using a dishonest manager to prove a godly point. So how does that position work with what you're thinking there, James? Now, on the surface, the general idea seems right, that 
You don't use lies to tell the truth. So on, on the surface, it, it seems to be true, but we need a little more clarification on this thought if we're going to agree with it. Because it's not, it's not wrong to take the truth that a sinner speaks and use it to honor God. That's not wrong at all. I mean, I'm a sinner. You're sinners. We are all sinners. And yet sinners can be used to proclaim the gospel. See, if, it, if this was not the case, if we, if we couldn't allow sinners to speak the truth or use the words of sinners, we couldn't evangelize. As every Christian is a sinner full of falsehood. An extreme version of this concept is what's behind the cancel culture that's running rampant today. We have, in our history, men who did some great, truly great things. But because they were sinners and sinned in currently politically incorrect ways, they're canceled. Their statues are torn down. They're whitewashed from our collective memory. We're not allowed to think about them or to give them any sort of human praise for the good things they did because of the falsehoods within them, the bad things they did. And it's not just happening to the old dead guys. But anything you posted on social media when you were a young and, and dumb kid can be resurrected, or just from yesterday, can be resurrected from the annals of the internet's history and used to shame and discredit you, to cancel you, to ruin you. One example of falsehood trumps any truth, any goodness in your life today. That's the way the world works. We don't do that. That's the worldly weapon being wielded right now in the spiritual battle we're engaged in. God himself has chosen to use us who are filled to the brim with falsehood to honor him by speaking the truth. He did the same with the Magi. God chose in his infinite wisdom to have St. Matthew preserve a situation where falsehood brought honor to God so all the church would know about it until the Lord returns to the last day. And it can be said that the whole point of the Bible is to show for our ultimate eternal blessing how God uses falsehood to bring about honor. Is that not what the gospel of Christ is? It's God using the falsehood of Satan and sinful man, my sins, your sins, that killed Jesus to reveal the truth that Jesus is his son, our savior, that every knee would bow and honor and give honor and glory to God. Let's leave it right there for a minute, take a break, and when we come back, We'll further our conversation regarding the Magi and falsehood and truth and honor and how we can be bold like St. Matthew. St. Paul as well. It's coming up on Cross Defense. As for Christians looking gullible by associating with certain people working in various fields, hacks, cranks, supposed con artists, social pariah sorts, that this would damage the witness of the church, the cause of the gospel? Well, this, my friends, is a risk that it seems too many Christians in too many denominations are far too worried about. This is a part of why we see mainstream Christian denominations, one after another, after another, after another, falling to the world's pressure. Why we see them flying rainbow flags, hosting drag queen children's sermons, ordaining transgender bishops, homosexual pastors, women into the ministry. Anything like this, anytime a church goes against what scripture is clearly teaching for the acceptance of the world, it's because they're trying to fit in with what the world is saying, what the world wants to hear. It's the scratching of itching ears to stay alive. <laughs> and ironically, all it's doing is killing them. They want to fit in with the world, which means they even want to fit in with mainstream science. Have you noticed how science is backing up all this transgenderism, the homosexual stuff, all the LGBTQ stuff? They have science in their corner, even though the science makes no sense. It would be considered pseudoscience, if you asked me. See, it's mainstream science that's giving the transgender movement a foot to stand on, backing up the anti-biblical thought that there are more than two genders and that they don't always align with the bodies they're in. It's the respectable mainstream scientists working with an evolutionary framework that are selling us this bill of goods, 
feeding this to our children. We have an entire generation growing up on this. Christian parents are struggling, wrestling with how to get through to their children that that is nonsense because they're saying it's what the scientists say. It's what the experts say. The respected scientists, the respected experts, the teacher in history class or in math class or in science class, it's all the classes at, at the public school. No offense to you, James, but you said you're a public school teacher teaching history. So I want to make sure, you know, no offense. I'm not saying you're doing this, but this is what my children are being exposed to in their public school from their history teacher. It is the case. I praise, I give praise to God that there are men like you, Christians, who are in public schools teaching history because then we know there are faithful men still teaching the truth. And there are faithful Christians in science, even working in that evolutionary mainstream science, who are trying to push back against that. Yes, we have Christians serving their vocations in these fields, and they are they are secret agents or something like this. They're, they're, they're plants. We have cells implanted within the, the mainstream that are working against it. It's hard. But that doesn't mean we have to bolster up the mainstream and keep it alive. No, no. We want to see that mainstream broken and fall down. And then all those Christian scientists, all those Christians in those vocations can do what they're called to do easier. They can do it rightly without being surrounded by the enemy, not having their voice lost in a sea of worldliness. See, with establishment comes status quo. And we have to be on guard. Just as Paul said to Timothy, chapter 4, we opened up with, we have to be watchful, always reading, always paying attention to doctrine, always paying attention to what Scripture is exhorting us to do, to say, to believe, the instruction we're getting from the Bible. We have to be on guard. That we don't let our sinful desire for acceptance, or fitting in, for credibility in the eyes of the world, protecting our reputations, that we don't let that override or overrule our fidelity to God's word. That is the thing that we are faithful to, not the establishment, not our reputations, not looking like we're with you know, the good old boys. Mm -mm. No, we must remember Jesus promised that the faithful will be hated by the world. John 15, 19 comes to mind, yeah? If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Too many of us in America have forgotten Christianity is not the status quo. We are not bedfellows with the world, whether it be mainstream science or mainstream entertainment or any, anybody, we are not cozying up against the world. The world is a wolf trying to eat the lamb. We are the lamb. And the world hates us. That concern that we might damage the cause of the gospel, brother, it need not plague our hearts, not at all. As Luther makes plain our doctrine, which is the Bible's doctrine, the Bible's teaching, Scripture alone, the gospel it doesn't rely on the endorsement and the support of others. We don't have to propel it. It runs by itself, and it will stand forever. Verbum Domini, Man in Eternum. The word of the Lord endures forever. This is our glory, Luther says. We can't damage the cause of the gospel. Don't forget, brother, we're all sinners. Christ chose to save us while we were yet sinners. While we were, as you think about Graham Hancock, cranks, quacks, misguided. It's in that state that he chose to come and be with us. To take us away from that. To clean us, to cleanse us. He does all the work. We can't damage the gospel. And this brings us to the third and final concern, that promoting the ideas of Graham Hancock undermines people's faith in sound science, particularly archaeology, you said. 
We especially do not need more encouragement to distrust science in general in our day. I think that's what you said, James. To use as an obvious example, yeah, here it is. Thousands of people, many of them Christians, have gotten sick or died from COVID-19 and other treatable illnesses because quacks and conspiracy theorists encourage Christians to distrust doctors and scientists. Okay. Yeah. See, this, this seems to convey a bit of the devil's divisive tongue here. We don't put our faith in science. Uh-uh. Not sound science or any other kind. Our faith is in Christ alone. That is the church's position through scripture alone. Any quote unquote faith we put in science is only because we have faith in God. Any respect I give to the scientist, to the doctor, any authority they have over my life, it comes from the same authority that other authority comes from, from God. As Jesus tells Pilate, my father, he's the one that gives you authority. So we don't put faith in science. That, be, that would be to put faith in man. We put faith in God. Our faith is in Christ alone, through Scripture alone. Whether science agrees or disagrees with the Bible, as we've said, is neither here nor there. Because Scripture stands on its own merits. This is our place of confidence in the inspired, inerrant Word of God. It is infallible. Man's science, on the other hand, man's knowledge, it's fallible. Human wisdom is fallible. I'll take the foolishness of God over human wisdom, the greatest of human wisdom, every day of the week. Because what we know today, here on January 7th, 2023, can change tomorrow. And, and true science recognizes that. True science is open. True history, archaeology, it's open to different ideas, whether they sound crackpot or not. And when that crackpot idea says there was a global flood, the church says, oh yeah, you finally caught up with the truth. <laughs> Glad to have you around. See, the church isn't interested in undermining people's faith in sound science, as you said. That is not our interest. We're interested in bolstering man's faith in God, or as we like to say on this show, equipping the mind with Scripture, exciting the imagination of the heart with Scripture, comforting the soul with Scripture, bolstering man's faith in God. The death, death, you say, and you point out COVID-19 and death. Yes, this is the conversation I've been having for the last, well, we're coming up on three years since the COVID pandemic. Death is a sad thing, absolutely. But we're more interested in eternal death than bodily death. So your example of thousands of people dying because of quacks and conspiracy theorists encouraged them to distrust doctors. That example is a great workbench to build up a reminder that physical death is not the worst thing that can happen to a person. Not at all. Not even close. Eternal death is the worst thing. Eternal separation from God is far worse than a thousand deaths by COVID-19 or anything else. Consider the spiritual death toll of all those who've died in unbelief because they were taught that the mainstream science was right. The lie that science has disproven the Bible, that God is dead, that we are the result of evolutionary processes, and that's it. That there's no such thing as God. That miracles aren't real. Mary, Mary must have slept with a Roman soldier. She, there's no way that she could have conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's, that's just superstitious fairy tale stuff that Christians tell themselves to sleep better at night. This is what mainstream science says. Where is our concern for the souls that daily die without faith in Christ. That's where the church is working. That's our interest. The whole world is trying to undermine faith in sound doctrine. We really aren't concerned 
with undermining sound science. We have enough to deal with trying to keep the world from undermining sound doctrine. Like St. Paul, quoting the pagan poets in the Areopagus, we can have a clean and clear conscience when we use the popular voices of our day, like Graham Hancock or Joe Rogan or anybody else, to equip minds, excite imaginations, and comfort souls with God's word. We use those as handles to deliver God's word. The America is full of pagans. And there is enough truth around them. Just, to, just in God's general revelation, that they're feeling their way toward him, as Paul says in Acts 17. What they don't realize is he is actually not far from each one of us. See, Matthew wasn't afraid to use the pagan magi to confess the gospel. Paul didn't flinch at the chance to use the words of pagan poets to guide pagan people to the truth. The truth of Scripture frees us to be bold like the confessors of old in our own confession. It frees us. Brother, I want your concerns to be laid to rest. I thank you so much for taking the time to articulate them and to send them my way. Thank you. That's one great reason to have Cross Defense on the air. We have another avenue of conversation and discussion talking about these curious topics and that's what the show does we talk about the curious cultural topics of our day from scripture what does scripture have to say and you my friend you provided a wonderful vehicle for that today thank you so much the holy spirit has been at work in our conversation because we've been talking about the bible we always bring everything back to the bible so i hope this brings some ease to your concerns. It helps lay them to rest. If any of you out there want to talk about certain things you hear on this show, you can go to stmarksferndale.com slash contact. S-T-M-A-R-K-S ferndale.com slash contact and drop me a line. I'd love to hear from you. We have uh, several other uh, emails that have come in. We're gonna, we've saved this last little bit of the show to bring up a couple other comments that were made. Let me uh, pull them up right now. All right, this one is from Pastor Packer. He writes in, Good afternoon. I was just listening to your episode of The Gospel in the Stars, and I really enjoyed it. I wanted to direct you to some things I think you will enjoy if you're not familiar with them already. He uh, points us to James Jordan's book, Through New Eyes, and he says it has a great chapter on sun, moon, and stars. Thank you, Pastor Packer. He also points us to uh, The Gospel in the Stars by Lutheran Pastor Joseph Seiss. And I believe it's it's this volume that is quoted, or a reference at least, in um, the, the Concordia book that we used in that episode, that I, I referenced in that episode about uh, discovering the Genesis world. I'll, I'll find my thoughts here. Don't worry. It's, it's been the end of a long show. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I am familiar with Joseph Seiss's work because it's referenced in that volume, but I haven't read it yet, and you say you haven't read it yet either, so uh, maybe one of the two of us can get, get it read, and we'll talk more about that. So uh, thank you for that. And oh, and li listen to this, my friends, cross defense listeners. He says, all of the major constellations are mentioned in the Gospel of Luke. So there's that fun tidbit as well. Hope all things are well. Blessings on your ministry. Thank you, Pastor Packer, and blessings to you as well. Also, we have some other comments about the Ancient Apocalypse episode from December 10th that's been the focus of today's episode as well. Uh, Wayne says, thank you, Pastor Bramwell, for using God's word to expand my understanding. I'm ashamed to admit that I until I listened to this study, I pictured the Tower of Babel as looking much like one, uh, in the Tower of Pisa. I thought it was purely an effort to use works to go to God. Boy, it makes so much more sense now that you've gathered Scripture together to explain the history of the ages. You offered the bigger picture and brought it together for me. I will share this with my friends. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne, for tuning in, and thank you for uh, writing in your comment as well. Let's see. we got another one from... Uh, uh, Papa John 63, Papa John X 63. Excellent work. I'm fascinated by this subject as, as well. Uh, this, this is the ancient apocalypse episode. I visited, uh, 
Teohuacan, I can't say these foreign words, and other sites in Mexico which have impressive pyramids and serpent myths. Please, Pastor Bramwell, if you ever find the time, consider sharing with us your thoughts on our ancestors' inclinations for human sacrifice. Oh, wouldn't that be an interesting show? This is as universal as the flood narratives. I believe these are perversions of the ultimate human sacrifice that we have in Christ. God bless your work. Oh, that's intriguing. Uh, so Papa Papa John X 63, we will take a look at that uh, hopefully in the near future. And RL writes in, the Holy Spirit doing all the work, tying it all together with a particularly coherent glue, the Logos. So thanks for that, RL. Really appreciate it. Um, and I think we're about out of time. So there's a few from the comment section. That was fun. How about that? Huh? Thank you all for listening, for tuning in. We have some more comments that we can get to and some more show suggestions in those comments that we'll, we'll definitely bring up in 2023. I can't wait to continue on with the cross defense. So thanks for coming along. Thanks for waiting out the Christmas season. I hope you had a wonderful, joyous Christmas season. And as Epiphany kicks off, I hope you have a little bit more understanding of how gracious our God is, that he, he even works through pagans to bring honor and glory to God as he worked through the Magi, these, these ancient pagans of old, to glorify Jesus Christ, even before the Jews did. Hmm, interesting stuff. All right, that's it for today's show, guys. God's blessings to you, and until next week, attende lectione. <laughs> attend to the reading. Cross Defense is a production of KFUO Radio. Find past episodes and support Cross Defense at KFUO.org.